Welcome to this training on how to turn around a business in financial difficulty. This is a fast paced 30 minute session. So let's jump straight in and get started. So it's next to impossible to come up with one working definition of a company in distress. Depending on the situation, there are probably 25 different signs of potential distress. The problem is seldom made up of just one or two of these things. And rather, it's more like the result of a greater number of them interacting together with other external factors. So here's a few of the common signs of business failure, cash flow issues, shrinking profitability, banks refusing your finance, clients are paying you late, directors not taking regular salaries, constant firefighting and high management or staff turnover. And most companies will face some kind of cash flow problem at some point, temporary cash flow problems or financial squeezes usually arise out of matters that are outside of the immediate control of the owner. But when problems do arise, it's vital to take the right steps and uh, move quickly to ensure the issue doesn't escalate. Now, I offer the following tips to help turn around a troubled business, uh, not as an accountant or an insolvency practice, practitioner or banker, but as a former CEO who has turned around a group of failing companies and as a business coach working with uh, many successfully turned around small to mid-sized companies. So these six steps for turning around a struggling business are based on a lifetime of first-hand experiences and are not taken from any academic textbook. Now, step one is adapt your mindset. The first step in solving any problem is recognizing there is one. The most obvious starting point has to be recognizing that you have some kind of financial problem and being prepared to face up to it and deal with it. So Often owners will shy away from the fact that the company now can't pay its bills when they fall due and, and merely relying on the hope factor that things will improve. But no one is going to voluntarily step in and help you. You must accept the fact that there is a problem and consider you know, really carefully what has caused that problem and what you can do to resolve it. And there are typically three phases to the decline of a company. Underperformance, where a cash generative company loses profitability because of weaknesses in its business, such as a loss of market share to competitors, or distress, the business cannot fund any activity outside its immediate operations and has difficulty meeting commitments to lenders and trade creditors. And then thirdly, crisis, the company suffers a critical shortage of cash, forcing it to use all the cash generated by the business to meet debts as they fall due. Now, unless the company takes action to address the difficulties it faces over time, that pace of the decline accelerates, the options available to the business and those that deal with it narrow, making a successful rescue or restructuring less likely. And not all businesses decline at the same rate. Where business decline sets in because of an external shock to the business, such as the failure of a key supplier that the business cannot replace quickly, the pace of decline can be rapid, leaving it, you know, little time to react. So the second part of adapting your mindset is to ensure the immediate survival of the business. So one of the biggest challenges for entrepreneurs in a precarious financial position is to make such difficult decisions, often for the first time. In fact, this situation may prove to be an opportunity to put measures in place that should have been taken a long, you know, long time ago, but that did not seem urgent. Now, one thing is certain, the status quo is not an option and you must not stay in denial. So the first step in turning around a business financial situation is to ensure its immediate survival. This involves making sure that the funds needed to continue operations in the short term will be available. And to do this, you, you know, first prepare financial forecasts to determine your short and long-term cash flow needs. And these forecasts will enable you to initiate discussions with your lenders and other financial partners to negotiate payment holidays or new financing or equity injections. And operational efficiency is an approach that will save a company in the medium term, but in the short term, you need to address the balance sheet, obtain subs subsidies or capital repayment holidays and reduce costs to maximize cash flow and ensure the changes can be made within the company. So, so during a time of financial distress or crisis, your priorities and focus must shift from the strategic to tactical. Think about an emergency room in a hospital. There are you know, only two strategic outcomes, keep the patient alive and stabilize the vital signs. Everything else is tactical. So things like keeping the heart beating, stopping the bleeding and keeping oxygen flowing tactically support the primary objective of keeping the patient alive. If you take this analogy one step further, the monitors and machines hooked up to 
the patient are all intended to measure the things that, that if they go wrong, will kill the patient. So in an emergency room, you're not measuring your cholesterol or body mass index because those things will not result in imminent death. And that is the same when your business is in final distress. It's not about wealth creation. It's about saving your business. It's all about survival. So step two is get clarity on the numbers. Now, after accepting there is a problem, the next key stage is understanding what caused it. So the most common cause of cash flow problems are caused by clients or customers not paying on time. Most new business is uh, you know, usually fairly tight on cash. Therefore, any slippage in the receipt of planned funds can cause you know, serious problems in paying your customers. So don't be afraid to contact your customer immediately and find out why they haven't paid on time. Remember the old saying, who shouts loud and be heard first. So other common causes, uh, root causes include high fixed costs. This is when the fixed costs are disproportionate to the amount of expected revenue. This quite often happens when you know, we resource up for growth and that expected growth doesn't happen or just generally poor cost management. Inflationary pressures on variable costs, sometimes referred to as cost of goods or direct costs, um, mainly up are made of basically labor and the materials required to make the goods being produced, or it may just be the labor required to deliver services. So shortages of labor can drive wages up or supply chain issues as we're seeing at the moment can drive up cost of materials. A uh, large degree of illiquid assets, this includes things like real estate or motor vehicles, assets that cannot be quickly sold or easily converted into cash for their fair market value. Revenue sensitive to economic downturn, industries like retail, restaurants and bars, leisure and hospitality and automotive often sensitive because they rely on, to a larger degree on discretionary spend of consumers, which often get squeezed in downturns. And bad decisions related to marketing or pricing, underpricing or heavily discounting products and services or fixed price contracts and times of price inflation all erode profit margins. So underinvesting in marketing can lead to shortfalls in sales income. And often it's not a single factor, it's a combination of factors. So once you recognize the problem and understood what's caused it, the next most important thing is understanding it. The, how that will impact on your cash flow in the short to medium term. Whatever the problem is, it will cause you to be unable to pay your suppliers when payments are due. Um, this includes not only your trade suppliers, but also PAYE, national insurance, VAT and utilities. You really need to rerun or create them if you don't have any cash flow and project and profit projections factoring in the current problem so that at least you will have some understanding of how this will impact your business. And more importantly, it should throw up how much additional finance will be required in the short time, uh, short term until the problem is resolved. So it may be that you can overcome this problem by talking with your suppliers and arranging temporary extensions to your terms. However, admitting that you have a problem to suppliers is really a last resort. Now, this is the five steps to freedom. This is the roadmap we use at Summit Scale Coaching to guide business owners through the development and growth of their business. So what happens in times of financial distress or recession? Well, many businesses slide backwards, often all the way back to chaos, even back into elements of the creation step. If, for example, it's re redefining its business model. But chaos is the pre-positive cash flow step when you're bleeding cash and trying to get control of your business. And control is just after you have cash flow and you're beginning to have the ability to reinvest in your business. And we talk about these steps a business goes through regardless of industry, because we know that these are the things that need to be focused on. So in the midst of a financial crisis, we know that a business can slide down from back from the five steps rapidly because these th things are changing rapidly around them. And what I want to do is just give you three strategies to help understand what to get back to do to get back above the cash flow positive. So these three strategies are the cash gap plan, the break even plan, and the tactical marketing plan. So let's have a look at the cash gap plan. The first thing you might ask is, well, what is a cash gap plan? So and it's an efficient plan to quickly collect your outstanding receivables, get your customers to pay faster and negotiate better terms with your vendors so that your bank account always has plenty of cash in it. In other words, a cash gap plan is a plan to ensure that you have enough cash to meet the needs of your business as you're continuing to grow your customer base, buy inventory or uh, stock and, and make your payroll. So when we do a cash gap plan, our goal is obviously to ensure that there's plenty of cash available. So the concept is a little easier to understand when you look at a visual, often called the cash conversion cycle. So in this particular business, they become liable to make payment for their inventory or stock at 30 days. They take 30 days to add value and ship the uh, inventory at day 60. Then as, an, as often the case, after you've shipped the product, you're given 30-day terms 
terms to their customers and then you've got to collect the receivables. In this case, you're receiving the cash at 120 days, so your cash gap is 90 days. That means for three months, you don't have the cash to use in your business. Even if you're a service-based business and don't buy in stock uh, or inventory, your inventory is the cost of services in the form of payroll expense. So in a non-distressed or normal scenario, we're focused on creating a zero cash gap position. So there's no gap between when you pay for your inventory or make your payroll and when you actually receive your money from your customers. This is the goal of any cash gap plan, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to get to zero cash gap. So you need to have a plan to fill in any gap that may exist. So how do we do cash gap planning? Well, the one tool is possibly the most important one you can master uh, to maximize the likelihood of survival. This is where we use a rolling 13 week cash forecast. You build a weekly cash budget based on what you anticipate to collect and what you anticipate you need to pay. And you can see this as a particular example in that the third week, the business ends up with a negative closing balance. Obviously, we can't let that happen. So we build out the cash forecast. We need to start to think of ways to accelerate inflows or slow down outflows. So we've updated the forecast to account for less outflow during this three week period to make sure we don't go into a negative balance. And so I view this as the anchoring scorecard for a business throughout a period of uncertainty. These are things that you have to plan for and then adjust over time. And believe it or not, you can even take comfort even from having a negative amounts because the idea is you've planned for it now where you're able to say, okay, do we need to explore external financing? So this is a really powerful tool for you to use in control of your cash as you move forward. Some businesses have a formal cash budgeting process in place. Very rarely it's weekly. I've even managed turnaround businesses where we did it daily. So if you'd like a copy of the 13-week cash, for, uh, cash flow forecast tool, email me at shane at summitscale.biz. Okay, so to work on the cash gap plan, there are some strategies that you can use. First of all, focus on faster collection systems. Maybe you want to incentivize your accounts payable team to collect money faster from your customers, possibly pre-sale products or services. I don't know if you uh, saw in the pandemic lockdown, uh, restaurants were selling gift cards at a discount that they could be used for 90 days. So they were getting cash in the door now, right, you know, right up front for their services. Another strategy is to defer fixed payment payables, for example, um, speak to your landlord if you're a retail business about deferring some portion of your rent. Are there other payables that you can defer through negotiating with your suppliers or vendors? Additionally, what are your stock or inventory levels and are you cutting unnecessary purchases? Look at all recurring subscriptions and decide if they, you know, any of those can be cancelled. And all of these things you should be doing when there isn't a distress or crisis. However, in distress, or crisis situation, it's also crucial to identify the right resources of extra cash that your business needs to stay in business. So it's important to asset access the right financing support. And if it transpires that you need additional short-term funding when you need to consider very carefully how you go about securing that funding. So any external funding will obviously cost the business money. Are you able to raise funding from your own resources, savings or family? If the answer is no, then you may consider other options. So does the company have assets against you know, which it could raise finance? It probably won't be cheap and effectively you lose title to the asset until such time as you pay off the finance. So better that, that than end up in liquidation having lost everything. And there are literally hundreds of asset back lenders in the marketplace. The governing body for asset back lenders is the Asset Back Finance Association. You can get a full list of their members on their website. Another form of asset financing that can provide uh, fairly immediate cash is invoice factoring or discounting. This is where you effectively sell your invoices to a funder. They will usually provide you with 75 to 85% of your invoice value immediately. And though this is not cheap, but again, it may be sufficient to tide you over until the problem is resolved. And if you are unable to raise additional finance, then the other uh, only other option is to consider deferring payments to suppliers. And that's a bit tricky. A few of us like admitting to we've got a problem and need external help. So let's get over the pride issue. We need some help. That said, you don't want your suppliers coming up to the wrong conclusion, deciding to reduce your credit limits or worse still placing you on stop. So there's every chance that your suppliers won't be too happy. But our experience is that uh, they would rather have a customer going forward than having to write off the current debt. And it's all about how you explain the problem to them. And the chances are they've heard similar stories before, but be polite, 
be factual, restrict your explanation, explanations to the key facts. Well, you know, and whilst there may be some third party maybe to blame for your problems, don't solely focus on that. Um, be accepting a, a degree of responsibility and being proactive in con contacting your customer with hopefully a workable solution and hopefully you'll achieve your aim. And a common mistake is, is not to pay the statutory liabilities on time, hoping that by the time HMRC uh, become aware you'll have solved the issue. And that doesn't usually happen. HMRC are now far more alert to when arrears become due, mainly due to their real-time payment scheme. And over the years, HMRC have become slightly more commercial than in the past and are slightly more receptive to requests for time to pay. However, you have, have to have a really good reasons as to why you've got a problem and a really good plan for dealing with it. So step three is implement a break-even plan. So this is the second tool to get above that cash flow positive. What is a break-even plan? What's well, an aggressive plan to stop the bleeding of cash temporarily, cutting all non-critical expenses or driving sales above the break-even by selling existing inventory or stock or service capacity to cover operating costs, debt service, and personal drawings. Now, this is a really common chart that has you know, been around forever. It's a really important for you to understand this break-even graph and how it works, particularly the concepts of break-even, net profit, and maximum utilization. The dark red line represents your fixed costs, including your overhead and administrative salaries. The orange line represents variable costs, which are made up of basically labor and the materials required to make the goods being produced, or it may just be the labor required to deliver services. When you add fixed and variable costs, you get your total expenses represented by the gray line. And the goal of the business is to generate enough revenue represented by the blue line to exceed the total expenses. The point at which the revenue line crosses the total expense line is where is which where the revenue equals total expenses is called the break even point just below that one and a half million in this instance. So in order for the business to break even, it has to start by covering its fixed costs. So every business has a certain amount of fixed costs that are essential to running the business and the goal is to get the fixed costs as low as possible. And the horrible thing about fixed costs compared to variable costs are that fixed costs have almost no connection whatsoever to sales volume. So if the business goes through something traumatic or is affected by an economic downturn or something, that the fixed costs don't go away. And that's a big downside to fixed costs. They don't typically change or go away without overhauling the business. So some examples of fixed costs are being locked into a building lease where you have to pay the landlord rent every single month or your quarterly insurance expenses or your equipment leases, or there's, there's a key salary or two of general managers or a bookkeeper. Costs that don't really have any direct relationship with sales volume, but they're key, they are key salaries um, that just need to be there in order to run the business. So there are all sorts of fixed costs that you can have in a business. And even if sales drop off those fixed costs, you aren't going to go anywhere and that's the problem. So every business needs to have a certain amount of sales to cover their fixed costs. And that becomes a challenge for businesses that are running at or below break even. So to implement a break even plan, what we do is we establish that break even revenue target. We evaluate the opportunities to um, reduce those fixed costs. We explore ways to manage the variable costs and then make sure we're utilizing all inventory and materials and stock on hand. Now that we start to communicate the new KPIs to your team, what is our target? What are we trying to accomplish here? And then implement the tactical marketing plan to hit the revenue target. And I'll go through that in a, mat in a minute. So just to give, me, give you six tips for implementing a break-even plan. So number one, be anticipatory rather than relying on your reflex. And what I mean by that is, since we don't know, you know how long you're going to be, it might be in distress for, or how long things are going to go on, for some of you, it'll you know, pay to think about and plan for phased expense cuts. Sometimes you can afford to carry a loss for a while if you have some capital reserves and choose to invest in some of it now. On the other hand, for many people, it'll just make more sense to get ahead of the curve and not, you know, not try to play catch up later. So you must use your best judgment about your specific situation. But every day you delay adjusting your burn rate, it's cash that's gone forever. And then Secondly, extreme frugality is the new mantra. Minimize expenses farts, cut fat, then muscle, but be really careful about the bones. Shredding, you know, shedding a few uh, excess pounds is, is very different from managing a broken leg. So most businesses are carrying around some excess weight. They can easily be trimmed. If you your strategy for weight loss is to amputate your leg, though, you'll limp for the rest of your life. So it does no good to you know, die of starvation of all your bones intact, but so be really thoughtful. But the critical, critical message 
uh, uh, thing here is more often than or not, the bones of a business are probably a few key employees. So here's the critical question. Who is your who in your organization is the bone? Who are the people? And if you lost them would result in your business limping after your after any crisis is over. Thirdly, the hardest expense really is to deal with payroll, which for most businesses is the single, you know, largest single expense on their financials. And the temptation is to imagine, you know, life after this situation, after this crisis and the recovery begins and, you know, and staff to that mythical level. But the other impulse is to fund everyone as long as possible or do an across the board 25% reduction in wages. And that's usually a mistake when you don't know the length of time you, you know, effectively going to be in hospital. So in my experience is wages need to get aligned with the current revenue. And that will involve some hard decision and some serious cut. But when the re recovery begins, you can start hiring again. But do think about it. The people you lay off are probably the same people you want to rehire when any storm passes. So be thoughtful about your conversations and generosity if you have to push the pause button on some of your team. Far better to retain your A players, the bones of your business, the ones that are truly critical to keeping the doors open either now or in the future and protect them. The payroll cuts of 20 or 30% should be really reserved for the weak or non-critical team members. So the question you must keep asking yourself is how do we maintain a workforce? But rather, you know, but rather, how do we survive during bad times? Break even, you know, is the is a win. And then during crisis, it's never just the business that needs some serious weight loss. It's most business owners have been overeating as well. In fact, it's not uncommon for business owners to eat regardless of whether or not there is enough food for the business. And it doesn't take, you know, a top MBA to understand that starving a business so that you can afford your lifestyle is a prescription for a very sick business. So cut personal expenses as much as possible. Be aggressive with this and start now. And then... Uh, this is kind of just money borrowed to stay alive as money that must be repaid out of future earnings. Uh, and that's not a tough concept, but it does get lost in today's buy now, pay lay culture. Any money you borrow or spend to support a non-break-even business is money that you will have to be repaid in the future out of future earnings. So be very thoughtful because there's no free lunch. While painful in the moment, tightening the belt and skipping a couple of meals today is far less expensive and painful than paying the tab tomorrow for the lack of ability to design a break-even scenario. And then final one, just in a financial crisis, you know, growth will not bail you out. And this is not about adding customers, it's about survival, and that's a critical point. You know, problem often the business is fine in, in financial distress. It's about how do we survive? How do we stabilize? How do we break even? How do we preserve our oxygen, our cash to be able to make it an extra month or quarter of need? I mean, how do we minimize the mortgaging of our future by being aggressively frugal today? So not all progress is measured by ground gained. Sometimes progress is measured, measured by losses avoided. Right. Step four is to focus on your customers. And um, if you have customers still around, you need to get on the phone with them and just ask them, how can I generate more value for you and the work we're doing? You need to make sure that the current customers are happy because if you're in this situation, you've probably be, you've been putting out fires, you haven't been giving the right attention and they might feel neglected. You want to get on the phone, schedule calls, make sure they're happy because the last thing you want to do at this point is to have somebody not paying an invoice or have somebody fire you or have a bad customer experience. So if you're a great entrepreneur, you probably have customers that want to tell you, you know, how much you, they appreciate you, but they don't need to know about any restructuring, but you need to make sure that they're, they're happy. Now, depending on the level of distress, you'll pr probably be wanting to win new customers also. So let's talk about the tactical marketing plan. And again, frankly, every business should have a tactical marketing plan through any normal period, but it's crucial right now in a, in, a, in a situation of financial distress to double down and continue to market uh, because customers are going to remember that businesses that are strong and informing them in the marketplace during any crisis. It's not an option, you know, just to slow down and to pass, disappear. So um, what is a tactical marketing plan? Well, simply stated, it's an aggressive, measurable plan to get leads, um, convert those leads to sales and get the right level of revenue per customer. And the key words here, are obviously, leads, conversion rates and revenue per customer. So the tool we use here is the profit equation. So the concept here is we just increase these things highlighted in black bold here by just 10 percent and it's ex exponential impact to the bottom line. So for in this example, for the prior period, if we achieved a thousand leads, how could we increase that by 10 percent to 
1,100 leads. So if we historically convert 20% of our leads to sales, how can we increase that to 22%? If we historically make 1,200 per annum per customer, how can we increase that by 10% to 1,320? And so you can see a 10% 10 10 increase in, in all five KPIs has a significant profit increase. Now, this is a sample, um, and, and but you can see the importance of leads conversion rate and revenue for, um, per customer. Now, in generating le leads, there are more you know, vendors and ideas out there on how to generate leads that you can imagine. But we like to talk about uh, lead generation strategies. And the, these are the 10 most important uh, lead generation strategies that we talk about with our clients. The most important part of the 10 lead generation strategies is that you pick two or three. You can't be average at 10, be great at one, be great at two, be good at three. You can't be average at 10. You have to pick the two or three strategies that are right for your business. And there are always ways to decide the right strategies are. One of the driving factors right now for lead generation strategies is what is the amount of working capital do I have to invest in marketing? And that may drive you to a certain strategy. Now, with these strategies, we have hundreds of tactics that go behind these strategies. So you pick the strategies, then about finding the right tactics to increase the, increase the leads for your business. So once you, we're focused on lead generation, now it's about how you convert those leads into sales. And number one, brand messaging goes back to, you know, what is your unique sales uh, proposition? What's the messaging you're using? Not just the messaging for your product, also what messaging are we using in a particular campaign? You know, a lot of online marketers use split A-B testing for different messages, different images to see what generates best results. We also want to look at the conversion rate by campaign. For example, from the three things we chose, what was the conversion rates per campaign? So we can determine where we can invest most in the most successful campaign. And then finally, what are our selling techniques? Techniques used by the sales team to improve conversion rate. For example, the sales script used by the sales team on calls, can that be a tweak to improve conversion rate? And then finally, revenue per customer. This is about getting the right uh, pounds or dollars amount per customer. We know historically referral uh, customers tend to have more tolerance for price. So your referral program, you might think about what products you're offering. You may want to also put, a, put into some price, some giving tax fix like charity, philanthropy, and community service. And finally, you want to think about operational tactics for implementing, you know, in, implementing customer-centric behaviors into your business. So the tactical marketing plan, what we need to do is identify two or three marketing tactics, establish KPIs to track marketing daily or weekly. And again, this is about cycle time. If you're not daily or weekly tracking around your marketing efforts right now, then you're not you're not adjusting as fast as the marketing uh, market needs you to adjust. So tracking those KPIs uh, and adjusting as you need is crucial. Take the profit equation, build out your targets. So now on a monthly basis, you're evaluating how you're doing against your targets. And again, being more proactive and agile is crucial. Now is the time to double down on your efforts because you'll gain you know, market share if you put in the effort now. If you do what you've always done, I can assure you, 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 you'll, you know, you'll lose through any uh, crisis. Okay, step five, review lessons learned. So up until now, we've all been focused on how the business stabilized, hunkered down, make the changes that enable to survive. Now's the time to plan out how the business is going to emerge from this situation. How can you emerge as a better, leaner, more profitable business? And in the world of business, we're often guilty of not challenging the norm. We, you know, instead satisfied, satisfied with following procedures and tradition, but it takes, you know, some courage and insight to, to question uh, why are the things done the way they are? How, you know, in times of crisis, you've got a bit more latitude to do so and you, you're actively seeking input. So, you know, leading companies nowadays recognise this and cultivate a more open questioning climate, you know, across a business at all times because a degree of continual review is healthy within a business. You know, the survival plan now has to evolve into the recovery plan, a business plan, build some forecasts, and many small and medium-sized businesses don't have detailed financial forecasts. So this is a really good time to spend some time on building out the budget and your forecast to reflect your new plan. Again, there may be need to some thought to who is going to do what within the team. Has everyone got the right role? Does everyone know what they're supposed to be doing? This is a great opportunity to review everything that's happening in your business. So try and uh, make sure you're really well placed to come out the other end. And many businesses have different groups of shareholders. For example, it could be a small business with two shareholders, 50-50. Over the years, they've decided that they want to do different things. Well, as Winston Churchill said, never waste a good crisis. 
this could be a really good time for them to actually sit down and have a frank conversation, decide what each of them want. Does one, does one want to exit or are they both going to decide on how they're going to go forward together? And now is definitely the time for a period of reflection on what you've learned as you've gone through this experience. Can processes be improved? Are the right people in the right roles? What was the pro business focused on? Was the business focused on the correct strategy? Can the use of technology you've been forced to use, like we've been through the pandemic, Zoom, improve efficiencies in the business? And as you reflect on reflect on what the business looked like if you're setting it up today with the benefit of hindsight. And then step six, the final step is build back better. So what's going to be really important? Well, and I keep saying this, but cash availability is the key thing that has to be focused on. The weekly forecast needs to be updated every day. Things change by the hour. So you keep on focusing on that cash flow. You're not going to lose control, hopefully. This is a really good time to look at the information that you um, use to run your business is the information that you really need. Often when you've been running a business for a very long time, there's information produced that has very little relevance to the key drivers today. So what information do you really need? What are the key drivers now? Are you monitoring them properly? And is the right information getting to the people that actually need it? And then what's the state of your sales ledger? Do you actually know who owes you money? So now's a good time to make sure that you have the right controls in place. That equally applies to expenditure items. One client reviewing their fixed costs discovered that they had more mobile phone contracts and staff. So all of these things should, should be actually, you know, in the end lead to a more leaner, profitable business. And the other thing that is important is communication. We need to understand from our suppliers how quickly we can get things done, just the impact on how quickly that we can service our customers. We need to tell our customers, say that, you know, that doesn't impact their business and if we all work together. So the main thing is to communicate within the business with your key stakeholders. And finally, you know, again, I'll say, make sure you're focused on cash. Right, just final couple of tips. Um, don't be afraid of seeking professional help. Your accountant will undoubtedly be able to look at your problem with an impartial hat on and without the emotional attachment that you may have to the business. Uh, it's likely that your accountant will be able to offer advice and alternative funding solution, solutions and they'll no doubt be able to make recommendations to other professionals. A business coach or mentor who has the experience in dealing with business turnarounds will help you guide you through the process. And from a legal perspective, you know, directors should be especially cautious and informed about the state of the company finances when things are tight, because at the moment of insolvency, your legal duties shift from being to your shareholders to the company creditors, failing to understand this and act accordingly can have serious legal and financial consequences for directors, such as wrongful trading. Uh, and finally, only discuss your problems with people you really, really trust and people you truly believe can help. It's quite simple having a word with a friend, but you must remember that in business, there are no secrets. It's, it's only secret if you haven't shared it. Okay, so if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. You're probably in one of three places now. Maybe at the end of this and say, hey, I'm good. I got this. Thanks. I've got a couple of tips. That, if that's the case, awesome. Really happy for you. Fat impressed with your success. Number two, you might be in a place where you're, well, I'm pretty good, but I have a question or two. And if that's the case, um, feel free to reach out. Go to timewithshane.com. I'm happy to, no obligation, no, happy to talk to you 15 minutes and have a chat about or answer the question or about how you do this or how you do that. And third, you might be in a place where you're saying, King, you know what, I need some help with this I'm, I'm because I'm struggling in this or other areas of my business. And if that's you, go to timewithshane.com and book a call. Let's have a chat about how you're experiencing your business. And if it feels a fit, we'll go ahead and book a longer discovery call. And at the end of that, if it feels like a fit, we can talk about how we might work together. So the challenges of most business owners that I work with are around time, team, and money. That's why I'm running these monthly lunch and learn training sessions for business owners such as yourself. Uh, next month's topic is how to recruit and retain a powerful team. That's on Wednesday, the 15th of December. So look out for the registration details. That's it. Bye for now.